Fire Pit Creative Group presents Aftermath, Episode 33, Under the Shadow. News about the arrests and detention of the dissidents traveled quickly. Rumors spread to all parts of the Phoenix Project, from the A-level to the Academy, from the hydroponics and food processing plant to the squalor. The leadership of the project were relieved, but that didn't stop them from perpetuating gossip. The citizenry were divided, with first and second class citizens equally pleased or disturbed, angry or concerned. The hospital was relatively calm when the names of the detainees came over the loudspeaker. Alexei Zavinovich, Gary Weinreib, Professor Harumi Gale. Major Leonard McGillicuddy lay in one of the reclining hospital beds. When he heard the announcement, heard the names, he drifted through time and space, sleep and wakefulness. His body fought to subdue his anger. In the mix of ambient noise, Names crackling across the loudspeaker, Cuddy tore himself from the windowing darkness. Tired eyes opened wide, staring into the glare of overhead lights. Trilling pain shot through the Major's arms and legs. He lurched forward. Dr. Aldis, Senora Maricela Santiago. In an instant, Cuddy grappled with the tubes in his nose, in his mouth, down his throat. He tugged, wrenching them from him. Nearby alarms erupted, monitors beeped uselessly. A square robot with a round head signaled for Dr. Ganaya. <coughs> Damn it. Cuddy pulled the wires from his chest and sighed. Bleary-eyed, the Major watched Amiral Ganaya dart from her barely lit office towards his bedside. Major! Cuddy! Fluid shot from Cuddy's nose and lips. He wiped his face on the sweat-soaked bedsheet. What the hell's going on? Ganaya reached out, hesitated, stood near the Major. Y you had a seizure realizing that restraining Cuddy was impossible. A series of seizures. You're stable now, but I'd... Cuddy cut her off, pointed at the speaker overhead. Mural sighed deeply. It was just announced. Your law division executed an arrest warrant on the dissidents. They were meeting secretly in the back of the cafeteria. The announcer continued reading out the names. I'm useless here, Cuddy said, swinging his legs out of the bed. I have to get up there. I have to go. Don't think that's such a good idea, Major. Cuddy stood, hovered over the physician. You want to observe me? Fine. I'm sure if something goes wrong, they'll haul me back here. He reached for a thin rope nearby, wrapped it around himself. Until then, sounds like I've got work to do. The Major walked past Ganaya, stumbling groggily towards the archway. What will you do, Major? Cuddy braced himself against the exit. He turned slightly. He heard the names being read aloud. An unsubtle message made to humiliate the dissidents, to scare their benefactors, and elate the population. For years, Cuddy led investigations into the dissidents, their leadership, their motivation, their plans. When interrogating suspects, he felt a great sense of power, control, in every situation. When making arrests, he knew he was serving the central processor, the council. He thought he was protecting the people in the project protecting them from acts of terrorism, lies about the Council, or from wild theories like those espoused by his friend, John Bath. Now, all Cuddy could think about was his lieutenant and corporal, whose hatred of the dissidents had eclipsed their mission to serve. Their methods were brutal, blind, and unhelpful. But they had been successful where the Major was not. Turning back to Meryl, Cuddy flashed a crooked grin. Then, he left the hospital. Donna Chang was reluctant. She didn't especially like the psychiatrist, Dr. Fox. His methods were absurd, especially as therapy for someone as distinguished, as level-headed as her. Donna was a self-trained engineer and physicist. She didn't need the repeated sessions with Fox imposed on her by the Phoenix Council. But 
If that was what it was going to take to get back to her work, her research unhindered, Donna would play along. Now? she asked. The bald-headed, full-bearded man nodded. Yes, now. And, Fox added, bright-eyed, maybe too enthusiastically, give it all you've got, Donna. Deep breath in. <sighs> Doing as she was instructed, Chang inhaled four seconds, held the breath a tick, and then screamed. She shouted long, loudly, trying to count the seconds, losing count, feeling her face flush with blood. When she finished, Donna glanced up at Fox, who grinned with glee. She wanted to smash his cherubic face. She wanted to... Don't think, Donna, the psychiatrist insisted. Just scream. Again. Donna leaned back, breathed hard, deep into her diaphragm. She screamed, leaning forward. Her eyes swelled. She thought of her father, Chang Wak Yi, how he dismissed her, buried himself in his work. He left Donna and her mother, his mistress, to fend for themselves while he enjoyed the prestige offered by the Shadow Council. Her father was an elitist, sexist, disappointed in his mistress and the daughter who was his only offspring. He wanted a boy to carry on what limited legacy was to be his in the confines of the project. Chang Wak Yi, or Chaki as he was called by his colleagues, indulged in fine food but picked on Donna or her mother if either gained as much as a pound. If you eat bread, you'll look like bread, he once said, when he saw Donna put a crouton in her soup. Again, Dr. Fox insisted. He reached for his patient's clenched fists. Donna bellowed, this time louder, remembering her father's drunkenness, physical punishments her mother endured, mental punishments she had somehow forgotten. You are lucky my wife didn't survive to see this unfortunate place, Chucky told Donna as if she was responsible for both the conditions of their living quarters and the Phoenix Project as a whole. She would not have survived this life. Donna always interpreted this comment as a criticism of her character. She was the product of an affair. She did not deserve a real family. Like her father, Donna belonged to the People's Republic, to the state. She gasped for breath, felt Dr. Fox opening her fists. Her nails had dug deep into her palms, not quite enough to draw blood. Someone will hear. Someone... The room is soundproof, Donna. Fox rocked in time to Chang's own movement. This was supposed to be soothing, but Donna felt awkward, afraid, untouchable. It's okay, Donna. You're safe here. Again. Chang shouted, hoarsely, painfully holding nothing back. She remembered Chalky's lovers, all peroxide blondes and ginger-haired westerners. Donna caught him with them. Whores, she thought undeserving women from the squalor, whose only virtue was they knew how to make themselves appealing and how not to get pregnant. Her father couldn't even be faithful to the mistress who survived the fall of New York with him. Chucky sent Donna to the cafeteria or the common areas, as if a reconstituted meal, an off-brand soda or freeze-dried candy bar would make her forget what she saw, that it would somehow endear her to her father. Instead, Donna wandered, too often she found herself in the Academy's library. The artificial climate controls always seemed to be inoperable. Alone and cold, alone and warm. It didn't matter. She lost herself in books, schematics, manuals. She taught herself how the Phoenix Project worked. How machines in the outside world were supposed to work. Maybe, she thought, by learning all she could about the project's bizarre amalgamation of 20th and 21st century technology, she could make herself an asset. She could impress Chucky. She could surpass his knowledge, his usefulness, make her father obsolete. There, there, Fox said, lightly touching the back of Donna's palms. That's enough. That's enough. Donna ceased shouting, caught her breath. Her mouth was dry. I love my father, she thought, remembering him on his deathbed the aluminum container of red notebooks. I hate my father. I am not my father, but... Do you feel better? Fox asked, relinquishing Donna's hands. He produced a cool cloth, handed it to her. Donna nodded cautiously, rubbed her raw, pink eyes with the cloth. Curse Fox, she thought. He made her feel insecure and yet strangely free. The feeling would not last. Or maybe she would find herself ruminating on these memories too long. Being vulnerable would limit her usefulness. 
Others would see something in her and criticize, even if not openly. Gestalt therapy, you say? Cheng asked, looking up. It's an old, less orthodox technique, the psychiatrist explained. Now, I thought we would transition. Try some EFT. EFT? Emotional Freedom Therapy. Cheng rolled her eyes. She stood, hovered over Fox, the towel dangling from her hand. Before she could say anything, a mushroom-shaped lamp on the doctor's small metal desk blinked. Oh, Fox said, turning, a look of alarm on his pink face. He did not take the towel. What is it, doctor? I don't know. Fox stood. He walked to the desk, tapped a button. Yes? Dr. Charles Fox, you are needed in the stockade. Stockade? The dissidents are apprehended. All right, I understand. Fox removed his finger from the button. His face suddenly seemed pale, bone white. I have to go, but I'll see to it that prescription for the hormones we discussed is delivered uh, promptly. Discreetly, Donna reminded him. She didn't want Miral Ganaya to know about the fluctuating levels of adrenaline and sex hormones in her body, the biological need to control them. Dr. Fox nodded. He scribbled something on a small pad on his desk and placed the pad in his shirt pocket. Chang thought it unusual the doctor used paper, analog devices, antiquated therapies. The thought passed. She watched him walk to the door, seemingly distracted. Dissidents? She said the word that preoccupied so many in the Phoenix Project over the past few years. Donna couldn't help but wonder if Dr. John Bath was one of the apprehended suspects. Yes, uh, yes, Fox replied. He pressed the button to open his office door. Donna glared with intent. Some of them are my patients, the psychiatrist replied. Then why haven't you turned them in, ratted them out, revealed, Donna? Fox raised his voice, then instantly lowered it. Everything that goes on here... Everything is confidential. They lingered in the doorway for a long moment. Chang folded the cloth in her hand several times. She watched the psychiatrist walk purposefully down the hall. She wondered why Fox would be called in to deal with criminals. Was he a witness? Was he useful in prying confessions? What more was there to the unusual man the Phoenix Council had required to treat both her and the dissidents? John Bath arrived in the stockade. The throbbing in his neck and temples made him well aware of his anger, the intensity in his expression. He pushed through the throng of security, visitors, and onlookers. John breathed deeply, tried to calm himself. Anger wouldn't serve him. Besides, he wasn't sure who he was really angry at. The law enforcement division, or Harumi, for getting caught. A conscripted sentry stood at a podium inside the dim, curved hallway, John stepped past the man. Hey, the sentry called out. There's a waiting list. Without turning, Bath uttered, I don't care, and continued on his way. The wide hall formed a circular corridor. The LED-illuminated stockade sat in the center of the round room. Pale blue light penetrated thick plastic glass and lit the floor. As he walked the hallway past men and women, some he knew, most he didn't, John scanned the interior cells, White padded rooms opened from inside. As many as six men, women, and children stood or sat in the pie-shaped cells. These are the so-called dissidents, John thought. Then, he arrived at the cell he sought. John glimpsed Harumi's blue hair, the back of her bare shoulder. He knocked on the glass. Nothing. John knocked again. Harumi turned slowly. She glanced behind her saw her mentor on the other side of the glass. Slowly, the diminutive professor stood. She walked towards John, saw her reflection between them. What is this? John asked. What have they done? Harumi smiled, raised an eyebrow. She couldn't hear John, but read his lips. She considered the limitations of her situation, observation by the law enforcement division and their security personnel. Resorting to a hybrid of international sign language developed by linguists in Dr. Bass Academy Laboratory, Harumi signed, You're disappointed. John stole a deep breath. He raised his hands, hesitated. I warned you. You were reckless. Harumi shook her head. You knew. 
in your own way, you approved. John felt a tightening in his chest. Harumi was right. She was always right. Even when she was willful, frustrating, she was capable of taking the risks, exhibiting the courage he couldn't. John signed slowly. No anarchy without risk. Harumi nodded. Are you all right? John spoke. Harumi looked behind her at a man and his teenage daughter. John followed her gaze. How in the hell, he thought, was it possible that children could be active members of the dissidents? Was this the face of terror that threatened order in the Phoenix Project? It was a setup, Harumi signed. Her head turned down, so John saw her eyelids and smeared makeup. When she looked up, John shrugged, as if to ask how or what she meant. The dissidents have met behind the cafeteria for some time, Harumi signed. You mean you, John spoke aloud. You've been meeting there. Harumi rolled her eyes, sighed as if bored with her lover. Fine, John. Her lips moved. She spoke audibly. The location moves sometimes. It's not always the same group, but this time, this time, it was the majority of the group. Somehow, law enforcement knew. They... She paused a moment, a hint of regret in her voice muffled by the glass between them. They knew we would be there. John's eyes narrowed. Someone on the inside. Yes, Harumi said, nodding slowly. They could have raided the meetings any time, but they chose to execute the warrant then, when Maricela was there, when these women and old men and children were there, when... Her voice broke off. Her lower lip trembled. John scanned the room, looked at each of the dissidents in their well-lit prison. He turned back to Harumi. He wanted to reach out, to touch her, hold her. He grinned. Usually, she was the one doing the consoling, easing his troubled mind. John wanted to kiss her and didn't care who saw them. I'll see what I can do, John mimed and pressed an open hand to the glass. Nearby, at the entryway to the curved hall, security recruits were pushed, voices raised, stanchions fell, security pushed back. Then, Major McGillicuddy entered the room. John turned from Harumi. He watched Cuddy, clad in an oversized t-shirt and loose-fitting pants, knock down one of the armored recruits. The Major was disheveled, his usually coiffed hair unkempt, his face unshaven. Out of my way, Cuddy growled. I'm Phoenix Law Enforcement. Hey, John called out. He walked towards the crowd, forming. Two more security conscripts pounced on Cuddy. Their pudgy faces showed confusion, fear. John thought of the Major defending them from oversized vermin in the tunnels under New York City, fighting rockheads at the exit to those tunnels. While they traveled the surface, Bath was imminently concerned about the security and safety of their simulacra. But what of their human bodies? Surely, conflict here in the underground tunnels of the Phoenix Project could waylay their best efforts to liberate its people. Before John could part the crowd gathered around Cuddy, he saw two official law enforcement officers. Both wore the traditional Phoenix battery gear, armor on chest and shoulders, knee pads, batons and electric pistols. All right, all right, the taller of the two officers ordered. That's enough. Cut this shit out. Enlistees relinquished their flawed hold on the Major. Cuddy wrestled himself to a standing position, tossed an older man to the floor, pushed another forcefully several feet into the transparent wall of the stockade. "'What the hell is this, Lieutenant?' Cuddy asked. "'Conscripted security? Arresting women and children?' "'They're dissidents,' Lieutenant Baker replied, a stern look in piercing eyes. "'This was your charge, Major. We just carried it out.' "'Whose orders?' Cuddy demanded, afraid of the answer. "'We have a warrant.' Corporal Reed stepped forward, a confidence in his manner that wasn't there the last time Cuddy confronted them. Who gave the order? The council. Who signed the warrant? Oh, come on, Major, Baker said. You know it was Colonel Marsh. Cuddy backed up a few inches. His left heel felt unsteady, his eyes glassy. Marsh. Her name and signature on the warrant, Baker said, turning to the volunteer security nearby. He raised his voice. You asked me, it was about time. Put this nonsense to bed. I told you not to move without me, Cuddy leaned in, teeth gnashed. Like you said, my charge. Lieutenant Baker shook his head. 
You know that's not how it works, Cuddy. The order comes down, we follow it. You weren't here, so we did what we were told. Cuddy shook his head. And that means calling up ad hoc support? Throwing everyone in cells? We needed backup, Corporal Reed interjected. Intel said there would be pushback. We took no chances. We... John stepped forward. Major, there's no chance all these people were named in a warrant. They were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Surely they deserve to know the charges. Surely they deserve to be arraigned. Who the hell are you? Corporal Reed said. It doesn't matter. Bath held his ground. Professor John Bath, Baker said. A sympathizer. Corporal? Baker glanced at Cuddy, then back over to Bath. Remove this collaborator from the stockade. Yes, sir. Reed squeezed Bath's arm hard enough to cause pain. Corporal. Cuddy stood between Baker and Reed. He shot a hard look at the lieutenant. Get your hands off Dr. Bath. Once you've identified them all, you'll let the women and children out of the stockade. You'll arraign the male prisoners and... And what? Baker said, pushing closer to Cuddy. Inject a chip in them? Dissidents can remove the trackers. That's why they've eluded you this whole time. The ones that don't, well, they strap bombs to themselves. He's right, Major, the corporal pleaded. This isn't like you. We have to... Shut up, Reed, Baker ordered. Cuddy glared at him. Baker, I gave you an order. The lieutenant spoke confidently. Right now, I am respectfully refusing that order, Major. I have a proper warrant. To hell with your warrant. Bath broke free of Corporal Reed's grasp. He forced the armored officer aside. Instinctively, Lieutenant Baker's arm shot out, a fist clenched, then clasped around John's neck. The chokehold immobilized Bath, who dropped to his knees. Cuddy drew back, then fired a fist square across Baker's jaw. His subordinate reeled, bounced back, squeezing Bath tighter. With his free arm, the lieutenant threw a misguided punch. Cuddy easily parried Baker's swipe. Palm out, the major struck the lieutenant in the nose, then brought his open hand back across Baker's head. The lieutenant went down. He relinquished his grip on John's neck. Bath staggered, gasping. All eyes in the oval corridor were on them. The prisoners in their cells pressed against the glass. They watched Cuddy hover over both men, eyes slight, damning. The Major turned to the volunteers, who stood back, leaning against the wall. One stripped off his uniform and borrowed riot pistol. Do it, Cuddy ordered the confused volunteers. Do it now. Beneath him, Lieutenant Baker peered up, eyes fixed and hard, burning. This isn't finished between us, Major. You've made an enemy, and the Colonel will hear about this. Volunteers entered the stockade to round up and release the women and children. Corporal Reed leaned down to help Baker up. Leave him. Cuddy's boot pressed into the lieutenant's armored chest. Get these people out of here. The council's gonna burn your ass for this, Reed snarled. Yeah, I'd be surprised if they didn't, Cuddy said, reaching out, grabbing John's hand. He pulled the coughing man to his feet. John rubbed his neck. Go, Cuddy told him, without looking. Get out of here. John knew better than to protest. His unlikely friend risked much to help him, to help suspected criminals. It was an unexpected role reversal on the Major's part. As he pushed through the throng of security and released prisoners, John couldn't help but feel an overwhelming, aching sense of trepidation. What was going to happen next? Outside the prison, John halted. He rubbed his sore neck and swallowed hard with difficulty. He glanced back. To his surprise, Bath saw his sometime colleague, the Phoenix Project's resident psychiatrist, Dr. Charles Fox. A pained, frightened look marked the doctor's doughy face. Fox held the hand of a young girl. Bath had seen the pigtailed, expressionless youth in the stockade. In a moment, John and Fox exchanged looks. John nodded curtly, but politely. Fox grinned, but there was a sadness in his eyes. The psychiatrist seemed vulnerable, Bath thought. Or was it the young girl Fox was protecting? Was she a patient? John turned slowly, then walked swiftly in the opposite direction. He thought less of the incident in the jail and more of the quiet exchange with the psychiatrist. Bath knew Charles Fox had been married, but his wife was deceased and he had no children. Who was the young girl and why was she arrested with the prisoners? Why was she with the dissidents?
Aftermath, a Fire Pit Creative Group production, based on a story created by Rhett Davis, with characters created by Rhett Davis, Warren Davis, Willem DeGrieff, and Cole Hoopengarner. Written by Warren Davis, with contributions from Cole Hoopengarner and Willem DeGrieff. Narrated and produced by Cole Hoopengarner. Music by Warren Davis, and video production by Willem DeGrieff. The sound effects used in the production of Aftermath are used with permission by the creators, and links to these sound effects can be found in the description section of each episode. Please visit our website, aftermathpodcast.net, for updates, original artwork and music, character dossiers, and more. You can also find us on social media, on Instagram at Fire Pit Creative Group Official, on Twitter at Group Fire Pit, on Facebook at facebook.com slash Fire Pit Creative Group, and on YouTube at Fire Pit Creative Group. Aftermath and its story, characters, music, and artwork are copyrighted by Fire Pit Creative Group.